Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. That statement is found in, in Psalm 8, verse 2, which was just read for us. And these words are also quoted in Matthew chapter 21. If you have your Bible with you tonight, I encourage you to open it with me to Matthew chapter 21. We'll be reading from there tonight. And in this context, we read about Jesus cleansing the temple. Now, uh, from time to time, I've been preaching through the gospel account of Matthew. And last time uh, I preached from Matthew, we, we read about uh, the passage that people will commonly refer to as the triumphal entry, uh, where Jesus uh, very meekly and in peace rode a donkey into uh, Jerusalem. And as he was doing this, you know, the people laid down uh, their clothing and laid down palm branches on the path. Uh, in essence, kind of rolling out the red carpet for Jesus as he's making his way into Jerusalem. And again, as he's walking into Jerusalem or riding the donkey into Jerusalem, uh, people were calling out to him saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Uh, they even call him a prophet in this context. And once he arrived in Jerusalem, the Bible says he entered the temple of God. The Jewish temple was once located in Jerusalem. And I say was past tense because in the year 70, it was destroyed. Uh, AD 70 or the year of our Lord 70 within the first hundred years of time as we count time. The year 70. Uh, it was destroyed by the Romans. And after this destruction, it was never built again. To this day, the Jewish temple is no longer in Jerusalem. So up on the screen here, this is a picture. This is just a, a model of uh, what people uh, think the, the temple could have looked like in Jesus' time. Um, but it was something like this. This, is, this would be a representation uh, and give us an idea of, of the temple that Jesus um, entered uh, on this uh, occasion. And so tonight as we read from Matthew chapter 21, we're going to focus on the following three points. Number one, the sellers cast out. The children cry out praise. And then number three, the fig tree... Curse. So we have three C's tonight. Cast out, cry out praise, and cursed. Now, what can we learn from all this? I think, again, one of the major takeaways is the, the temple today is the church. We learn from this context that within the church, God's people should not be buying and selling and engaging in, in that kind of business. Uh, the church is a place where we need to emphasize worship. Focusing on God, praying God, uh, praying to God, praising Him, uh, that should be our focus within the church, within the holy uh, assembly. And some people in Jesus' time, they had lost sight of that. So again, if you have your Bible, let's start reading in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21, and we're going to pick up with verse 12. Matthew 21, verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God. And cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. So imagine what Jesus did on this occasion. Imagine we could go back in time and we could watch what Jesus did here. Now there's a brief mention in verse 14 where uh, those who were blind and lame, they, they, were, they came to Jesus or they were brought to Jesus and he miraculously um, healed them. So that is mentioned there in verse 14. However, before the people were healed, the temple needed to have some healing. So he went into the temple and he found people there um, doing business. Right now, if we go back to verse 13, the end, the end of verse 13, uh, regarding the house of God, he says, you've turned into a den of thieves. Now, this this language might indicate that they were jacking up the prices to, to really gouge people um, who had made the temple. And again, the Jews offered animal sacrifices and things like that. And uh, some just couldn't travel all that way with an animal. 
And so perhaps they, these people who are buying and selling, they're really taking advantage of people. And in that way, they were stealing or acting like thieves. And so um, here Jesus says, you, you've made it a den of thieves. And you know, this, is just a, this is just a simple picture. This is an artist you know, illustration um, of what this possibly could have looked like. But again, think about what Jesus did on this occasion. Again, he went to the temple. He found these people doing business. He knocked their stuff over and he threw them out. The text says he threw some of them out, right? Jesus must have been fairly strong, right? I imagine some of those people might have tried to resist him and he had enough strength to you know, get some of these people out of there. Now, I've been, I've been preaching through uh, the gospel account of Matthew every so often. You know, I haven't you know, purposely just selected this passage for tonight. I'm just picking up where I left off. You know, my goal is to cover every verse and eventually go all the way through the book of Matthew. And uh, I just mention that because when you take the time to, to just read through Scripture, you know, just try to read through a book, read through the Bible as a whole, you will encounter all the information that God wants you to know. And I say that because it's important that we do not create a false image or a false idea of Jesus in our minds. The kind of Jesus that you know, some people think uh, only lived to please people no matter what. That everything he said was received well by others. And uh, a Jesus who tolerated immorality and sin, uh, sinful behavior. And that simply is not the picture of Jesus we find in the New Testament. Um, you know, a lot of people today, they, they want to talk about tolerance as if tolerance is the highest ideal we can strive for. And in essence, the, the, the person who is the most tolerant, that is the best individual, that is uh, the most moral kind of person there is today, the one who truly embodies tolerance. Well, that's not really, I think, a great ideal to strive for. Now, was Jesus tolerant? Sure, he was tolerant at times, but we can see from scripture, he was tolerant up to a point, right? He did not blindly accept this person's truth and this person's truth and what this person believed and what that person believed and so on and so forth. It was not his mission to please people at all costs. Christ was more concerned about pleasing the heavenly father. Now, earlier in Jesus's ministry, he cleansed the temple because people there were engaging in business. And so this is actually what we're reading here in Matthew 21. This is actually the second time he's done this in his, uh, his ministry. Um, the first time is recorded in John's gospel account. So this was much earlier um, in his ministry. Notice what it says here. John chapter 2, verse 16. He said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Right. So here his rebuke doesn't seem as strong. Again, in, in Matthew, he, he says, you've turned God's house into a place for thieves. The first time he did it, he, he's saying you're making God's house a house of merchandise. And merchandise just simply indicating they're in a place that should be dedicated to worship and praise and thinking about God. And they turn it into like a marketplace. They're buying and selling and just engaging in business. And again, Jesus cleansed the temple, cleansed it of that pollution. Now, again, this is the Jewish temple that we're that we're thinking about. And again, this is this is significant. Jesus was a Jew. He lived during the time that the Jewish people were, were still under the authority of the law of Moses. And he was ushering in and bringing in the, the New Testament. But he's still living under the authority of the law of Moses. And the temple was a big part of of that religious system. So again, this, this is just a model. As far as I know, this is a fairly accurate model. And uh, again, a likely representation of what the temple uh, would have looked like. So notice the temple. This is the temple proper. This building right here in the, the middle. Uh, but it's sitting on this, this tall foundation or this tall platform. Uh, keep that in mind. So this is the actual temple, and this whole thing with the perimeter uh, is part of the what would be called like the temple complex. This whole thing, and it was massive. Um, and my understanding too is the temple 
If you read your Old Testament, it was once destroyed by the Babylonians, the, the original temple that King Solomon built. And when the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, they actually took the rubble from the first temple and they made this portico or this covered area with some of the remains of the first temple. So uh, this is sometimes called Solomon's porch or Solomon's portico because remains from the first temple were actually incorporated in the, the building of that part, that part of the structure. So again, this, this is the second Jewish temple uh, built by Herod. And this is the temple that existed in the first century that Jesus entered. And again, people were buying and selling animals probably somewhere in one of these uh, courtyard areas. Now, as I mentioned, the temple was destroyed in the year 70 and it was uh, n never built again. There's never been a Jewish temple there after the year 70. So these are actual photos of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And, you know, we ought to remember when we're reading the Bible, we read about places like Jerusalem. These are not made up places, right? These are places that exist in the world. Some of them still exist there. Jerusalem's still there called Jerusalem. So these are actual photos of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So again, you can see that foundation or that uh, 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 platform, that huge platform that goes all the way around here. And notice this building in the middle. This is a Muslim mosque. So again, uh, uh, what a church is to Christians, a mosque is to Muslims. So there's actually a Muslim structure there now. And Muslims congregate and worship on the Temple uh, Mount. And not Jews, but, uh, but Muslims. So again, here's a, here's a picture of the Temple Mount from a different angle. So again, the, the platform's still there. I mean, these are massive stones. I, I, some of them weigh tons, like 13 tons for one stone in this, plat, this platform or this foundation. But the, 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 the big foundation, the platform that sits on, it's still there. But the, the temple was gone. It's, it's gone. The Jewish temple. And uh, notice here I've put a, a circle up on uh, the, the slide here. I'm going to zoom in on this, this area. So we're going again to this kind of corner of the, this foundation wall. And uh, what did Jesus say about the temple? And this is, gonna, this is a little bit of a preview because eventually we'll, we'll cover this in more detail when we get to Matthew chapter 24. In Christ said, Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Right? So what you see right here, this wall, this is the, the side of that foundation wall or that platform. And when the Romans came and destroyed the temple, the Jewish temple in the year 70, if I can go back to this, uh, this model, uh, Apparently there's a lot of like gold uh, decorating parts of the temple and all this was set on fire and the gold melted and dripped into the bricks and the stone and everything. And so when everything cooled off and the Romans took over, they came and they literally, all these buildings and the, like this, this building and the temple proper, they literally tore it all apart to get to that gold and threw it off and pushed it off that huge platform. And again, Jesus prophesied that would happen. He said regarding the temple, it would be thrown down. And so what you have here, again, what I've zoomed in on, all that rubble and those, those big stones right there, those are actually the remains of the temple from, Jew, from Jesus' time, the Jewish temple. They've actually been preserved there as a national monument for the Jewish people. And you can see, um, if you can make it out, there's this area right here is roped off. This street is caved in and broken where the, the temple stones were thrown down and they actually broke the street. So you can see the, the, the streets bowed in from just the impact of these, these stones being thrown down. So again, these are still there in, in Jerusalem uh, today. So again, I bring all this up because when we think about Jesus' words, we might say, well, Jesus was a Jewish man. He's talking about things regarding the temple. That has nothing to do with us as Christians. That's all Old Testament stuff. And it is, you know, it is Old Testament stuff. 
Um, but we need to make application for ourselves today because there is a temple of God today. And uh, we're told specifically uh, what it is um, in the New Testament. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16. So the New Testament teaches, I believe this was stated before the destruction of the temple. Again, just showing that you know, by inspiration, I believe uh, whether they knew it or not, the Holy Spirit knew. Jesus knew, of course, the temple was going to be destroyed. And so Paul is writing to Christians saying, you're the temple of God. Don't you know that? And uh, um, again, this is in the plural. You all are the temple of God, writing to Christians. So when we come together today as a holy assembly, that's where God's spirit is today. That's where the temple of God is today. It's not about a building or location. It's about coming together um, in faith. The church is God's temple today. The church is the people. Now, with this in mind, you know, churches, local churches, they typically meet in one location. And that being a you know, church building. And I've seen church buildings. I'm just using church in, in the loose sense. Anyone who claims to be a church. Um, I've seen church buildings where they sell donuts. They have a whole coffee set up, like a whole like barista situation where they'll, they'll sell all kinds of coffee and stuff. I once lived near a church building where they had a full-on gym. And they actually would allow people in the community to pay them to work out in their gym that they had in their, their building. And again, people who would use a, a, a church building that way, again, they're using their building to sell merchandise in one form or another. And I would, I would suggest for your consideration that for the church to be engaging in that kind of business... Um, goes against the spirit of, of what we find here in Matthew chapter 21. In the business that we ought to be engaged in as God's people is the Father's business. In worshiping Him, praising Him, uh, when we come together in that holy assembly, that's what we need to be about. Uh, buying donuts, buying a cappuccino, using exercise equipment, nothing inherently wrong with those things. Seeking out entertainment, nothing wrong with that at all. But we can do all those things outside of, of the church, right? There, there's a time and place for all things. So the church is not the time and place for all that stuff. All that stuff belongs out in the, in the world. You know, Jesus took a strong stand against those who were polluting the temple. And his actions got people's uh, attention. Again, he, he cleansed the temple. He healed some people. And we read about children on this occasion crying out to him. Um, saying to him, Hosanna, son of David. So let's, let's continue in our text, Matthew 21, and we'll pick up with verse 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. So again, on this occasion, the children are crying out to Jesus, saying to him, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, if you recall, this is the same thing people were saying about Jesus earlier when he was riding into Jerusalem. Uh, if you go back to verse 9, chapter 21, verse 9, uh, the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So by the time he comes into the temple and he cleanses the temple and he heals some people, the children are repeating this, saying to Jesus, Hosanna, right? Hosanna to the son of David. So they're repeating what others were saying um, earlier. Now, if you look at the end of verse 15, we learn the chief priests and scribes, they were not pleased with this. They're sore displeased, the King James said. I think some other versions might even say they're angry. So they're not happy at all that these children are, are saying this about Jesus. Um, you know, one author said, the leaders could condone the temple being turned into a stockyard operated by crooks. They could not endure the praise of Christ and his just criticism of them. And I think that's uh, well said. It gives us some food for thought. 
Um, look at the beginning of verse 16. They asked Jesus this question. So again, the, 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 there's kids here crying out to Jesus, saying certain things about Jesus. And their question at the beginning of verse 16, again, this is the, the scribes and the chief priests, some of the Jewish leaders. And uh, hearest thou what these say? Right? So they're saying this about the, the comments made by these, uh, these, these children. And their question implied that Jesus should stop them or correct them. Or Jesus should somehow intervene <clears throat> and basically tell them that what they're saying is wrong. Now, why are they so upset about this? Why do they care? Why are they sore displeased? Well, again, to, to say to a man <clears throat> at this time, Hosanna to the son of David. That's equivalent to calling that man the Messiah, the Christ. Again, this, this idea of him being a son of David is, has hev, heavy messianic implications. So they're, they're in essence, just if we could just summarize it, they're in essence calling Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And on this occasion, these chief priests and scribes, they didn't agree with that. And they wanted Jesus to somehow can intervene, correct that. Um, you know, because they thought that was a false claim, right? Because they didn't, they didn't think he was the Messiah, of course. So again, if I just had the liberty to, to put this in my own words, you know, verse 16, they're saying, don't you hear what these kids are saying about you? You need to correct them, right? You need to, you need to do something to intervene, you know, something along those, those lines. Well, how did Jesus respond to this, this question? And, and then again, these Jewish leaders being displeased. Well, the middle, the middle of verse 16 here, after their, their question, it says, Jesus saith unto them, Yea, haven't you read? Right? So he's quoting scripture now to them. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. So here Jesus quotes Psalm 8, verse 2. And he's commending what these children were saying about him. Right? These these, these babes, these infants, these children are basically, they have more understanding of who Jesus is than these seasoned reli uh, religious leaders. And uh, again, so Jesus commending the children for what they, they said. So again, they, they say to Jesus, hey, don't you hear what these kids are saying? They're, they're calling you the Christ. They're calling you the Messiah, son of David. And the short answer is Jesus said, yep, that's right. No, haven't you read the Bible? <laughs> uh, so that's his, I mean, that's his uh, answer. And so if you're someone who likes to take uh, notes, uh, whether you mark in your Bible or you take notes on a piece of paper, I would encourage you um, to write something next to verse 16 that Jesus accepted the claims that he's the Messiah. He accepted the claims that he's Hosanna to the son of David. And uh, again, if you like to take notes, I'd encourage you to also to jot, jot down Matthew 16, verses 15 through 17. And uh, if you recall, that's that famous passage where Jesus said, I will build my church. Right. And that, that context begins when he's asking the apostles, who do people say that I am? And there's all kinds of answers and ideas about who Jesus was. And he asked the same question, but he asked it of, of his, his, his disciples. Who do you say that I am? And then we have that statement from Peter. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And once again, on that occasion, Jesus received that statement and accepted that, that statement. He said to, to Peter, blessed are you, right, for saying that. So again, that's found in Matthew 16, verses 15 through 17. So in both of these passages, we have Jesus accepting these, these claims and these statements that he's the Christ. Again, another word for Christ is Messiah. They're interchangeable. So Jesus, uh, after this encounter with uh, the scribes and the, the chief priests, and after he answers their question by quoting scripture, uh, he left and he, and he comes back the next morning. And the text tells us he was hungry and he found a fig tree. So this will be the last point we'll focus on tonight. The fig tree cursed. Oop, there we go. The fig tree curse, verses 18 through 22. All right, Matthew 21, verse 18. Now, in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. 
And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if he shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Right, so what's going on here? Why did Jesus curse this tree? Right? Uh, well, this tree, it had leaves. So from a distance, you know, Jesus knew it was a fig tree. From a distance, uh, a person would think that the tree was, was healthy and producing fruit. Now, it's interesting. You know, I think it's in Mark's account where it mentions the same story. It says it wasn't the time for figs. Um, and I've heard people give different answers for why Jesus would even expect figs if it wasn't the time for figs. Um, so what I've heard, you know, maybe Bart's the one to talk to. I don't know if figs grow differently in Jerusalem or what, but from what I've heard, when a fig tree has leaves, that usually indicates it's also bearing fruit. So that's what I've heard. So even though it wasn't the typical season, if it had leaves, there is likely some fruit there. So that's how I've heard people explain that because it's kind of a, a conundrum some people have or a question some people have. So this, this tree had leaves. From a distance, it would appear that it was healthy and producing fruit. However, when Jesus got close and he, looked, he uh, inspected it, uh, the tree had plenty of leaves, but there's no fruit there. Right? And again, the whole point of having a fruit tree is that you eat its fruit and you enjoy its fruit. So why is this happening? Does Jesus just hate trees? Right? Well, no. I think there's, there's a spiritual lesson uh, here for us to think about. Uh, Jesus used this fig tree to teach a lesson about faith. Um, and you see that as he continues on in those verses, he talks about praying uh, in faith. And he is speaking specifically of the apostles here, which I think um, is important. Um, some people believe this fig tree represented the nation of Israel. Uh, or more specifically, the unbelieving Jews, which at this time were rejecting parts of the Bible. And again, those who didn't believe rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And again, just staying in this context, we can see an example of that in Matthew 21. Uh, the scribes, uh, the chief priests and the scribes, who are not happy with the, the, the children, the people calling out to Jesus saying, Hosanna to the son of David. So uh, this is an interesting point that some people make. And there are passages in the Bible, uh, especially Old Testament passages, which compare God's people to a fig tree or a grapevine or some other kind of uh, agricultural metaphor. You do see that kind of language in the Old uh, Testament quite a bit. So I think there is merit to that explanation. Uh, but with all that in mind, I can't see in this context uh, that this passage would lead us to that one conclusion, that one specific thing. Um, I don't see that, that one thing here. I, what I take away from this is a more general lesson uh, about faith. Um, again, if a tree here is meant to symbolize people, people of faith, and we're known by our fruits, as Jesus said in some other passages, you know, trees known by its fruits then we're defined by our actions. Uh, we're defined by what we produce in life. Uh, a fruit tree, which has leaves only, right? And no figs or no, you pick your favorite fruit, no apples or peaches or whatever. If it just has leaves, then it's the idea of someone who is claiming to have faith, but they're just putting up a show. They're, they're not really producing any kind of godly actions or godly behaviors. Um, in their life. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. It describes those who have an appearance. Of godliness. But the truth is they're not. And uh, the same idea is repeated. In Titus 1 16. Um, here the Bible says. They profess that they know God. But in works. They deny him. Being abominable. And disobedient. And unto every good work. Reprobate. 
And so the Bible cautions us about those in the world who will claim all day that they love God, they know God. But when you get close and you really think about their actions, the fruit that they're producing, uh, really their actions would show they deny God. They're not trusting in the God of, of the Bible. So in the context of Matthew 21 that we've just read, the, the verses we just read tonight, um, I think about all those people who were in the temple and near the temple. And perhaps, this is just me speculating, but perhaps some of them thought that simply because they're near the house of God or even in the house of God, that they were righteous and they were in God's good graces. However, they were so offensive to the Son of God, he knocked their stuff over and threw them out. And some of the men who are supposed to be religious leaders and spiritual leaders of God's covenant people, they were so hard-hearted and blind to the truth, they wanted to destroy Jesus, the very one who came to save them. So the fig tree, that's how I view the fig tree in this context. And these people not worshiping in the house of God, the religious leaders not recognizing the Messiah when he's right there in front of them. The fig tree is a reminder that we should not become hypocritical um, in our faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We, we look at this occasion when Jesus entered in Jerusalem, cleansed the temple, did miracles. And some people saw his actions and they responded by saying, this is a prophet. Hosanna, the son of David. In essence, they're saying, this is the Christ. This is the Messiah. And others saw all those same things. And yet their response was, we're not happy about this at all. We're sore displeased. They thought Jesus was condoning false statements. People calling him son of David and so on. They wanted him to clear that up and correct that. You know, these, these children don't know what they're saying. You need to put these, tell these kids to be quiet. And yet all the people there, they all saw those same things. And yet they responded to Christ differently. Right, well, why the difference? Well, it all boils down to the individual and their heart. Jesus does not change. The individual's heart is what must change. May we endeavor to read the entire Bible and have a whole and balanced view of who Jesus is. Now, Jesus, of course, is many things. I mean, he's infinite in the true sense of the word. He is compassionate. He is loving. He is gracious. He is selfless. He has all those wonderful characteristics that we should focus on that we find in Scripture. However, with that in mind, Matthew 21 reminds us Jesus is zealous for fulfilling God's will. He did not tolerate those who are polluting God's house. And the Bible promises us that one day Christ is going to return. And he's not coming to bend over backwards to please worldly minded people. He's returning to accomplish the will of God. So let's be prepared for that day. Again, let us be people of, of genuine faith. So if there's anyone here tonight who's not yet responded to the gospel message, we encourage you at this time, there's, there's no better time than present to begin your, your journey and commit yourself to Jesus Christ and ultimately putting him on baptism and coming up from that watery grave to walk in newness of life. And if there's anyone here tonight who's subject to the invitation, please let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.